Hi everyone, welcome to Coffee with Lynette. Today we have a very, very special guest, Dr. Joseph Tainter. He is the author of The Collapse of Complex Societies, as well as uh, he holds a PhD from Northern Western University, and he is the professor in the Department of Environmental and Society Studies at Utah State University. He is well known globally for his studies on complex societies, and since I believe that's what we're dealing with right now, I am so happy to welcome him to today's show. Dr. Tainter? Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Oh, it's a pleasure to have you. So I think that we should start uh, just to, so that everybody's on the same page. Would, would you define what you mean by the collapse? Yes, well, to do that, I have to define what I mean by complexity, because I regard a collapse of a society as, as a rapid loss of complexity. In, in other words, a rapid simplification. So if you consider the evolution of human societies from our first ancestors up through today, some of the defining characteristics are um, that we have developed more and more diverse technologies, more and more capable technologies, we have more and more institutions. We have more kinds of social roles than simple hunting and gathering bands had. So part of what I mean by the evolution of complexity is that a society comes to have more and more kinds of parts. Uh, as I say, perhaps more kinds of technologies, more kinds of social institutions and social roles, uh, a society that produces uh, more kinds of information. So complexity consists in part of more and more parts, uh, what we, in a technical sense, we would call that differentiation in structure. Mm -hmm. The other part is organization. What binds the parts together to make them function as a whole? To in a human society, this can be such things as, as norms, customs, how we socialize and train our children, and on a more formal level, of course, rules, regulations, and laws. These are all aspects of organization. So by complexity, what I mean is structure and organization. So as human societies have grown more complex, they have differentiated in structure, in other words, come to have more and more kinds of parts and more and more organization to bind the parts together. So that a collapse, when it happens, is, is basically a reversion of that process. It's a rapid loss of complexity, a rapid simplification. Now, the important thing we have to keep in mind is that complexity always has a metabolic cost. This is mm -hmm. basic thermodynamics. More complex societies are more expensive to maintain, they're costlier to maintain than simpler ones. So that as human societies have grown more complex and, and more capable, they've also grown more costly. Uh, so that today, we're not only able to produce much more energy than our ancestors ever could, we have to produce much more energy than our ancestors ever could. So the evolution of complexity really relies on the evolution of our ability to gather and process energy. So complexity and energy evolve together. Okay, and that energy can come from natural resources and part of that is also human labor, right? Well, ult ultimately, all energy in the past came from the sun and, and that would have been the source of human labor. Today, we do use energy from the sun, but we use it primarily from past solar energy stored in fossil fuels. So the development of fossil fuels was a major breaking point in, in human history that allowed us to get, to get beyond the constraints of how much solar energy do we receive on a daily basis or on a yearly basis to be able to tap into millions of years of past solar energy that's stored in fossil fuels. But uh, fossil fuels are a diminishing resource, right? They get used up. That, that's true, and that is a concern um, that, that we need to be aware of for the future. The, the important thing about fossil fuels is not the overall supply. There, there's a lot of oil left in the world, still left in the ground. The most important thing about fossil fuels is that it takes energy to get energy. So that we have to account for what is, what is our energy profit when we produce energy. 
We have a term that we use for this. We call it energy return on investment. And by that, we don't mean monetary investment. We mean energy returned on energy invested. Mm -hmm. Um, And and to give you an example of the trend in, uh, we call this EROI, energy return on investment. In 1940, the United States produced oil and gas at an energy profit of 100 to 1. For every barrel of oil that we would use searching for and producing oil, we got 100 barrels back. That's now down to 15 to 1, and the trend is irreversible. The trend cannot be changed. It will continue to decline. This is the most immediate threat to our energy supplies, is not overall amount of, say, petroleum that's available, but our energy return on investment to get it out, our profit in producing it. Right. That makes a lot of sense. And then when you look at where we are in this cycle, look at how much energy, I mean, this kind of ties into the whole cryptocurrency uh, phase that we're in, which takes a tremendous amount of energy to create, what, a mathematical formula. But how does this, yes, yes. How does that tie into what you're talking about with the depletion of the energy? Well, it's, it simply illustrates the process that you know, the, the addition of these cryptocurrencies is a complexification. We have, we have added more parts, more kinds of parts to, to our economic system, and, and that takes energy. And, and I have seen figures recently that were rather surprising that, that mining for bitcoins is actually taking a very large amount of energy, more than I would have ever imagined. Um, so it, it, it's simply a nice illustration of how increasing complexity requires that we increase our energy consumption. So that, that also, you know, when we're talking about all of this complexity and where we are in the cycle, uh, to me, what I'm looking at, but I, I'd like you, based on your experience, to verify this or, or not, but it seems to me like things have gotten so extremely complex and the need to modify everybody's behavior to go in that same direction. Are they trying to uh, stave off the collapse with new innovation? Yes. Um, Since since I did the study of how ancient societies collapse, I have extended my work to sustainability today. And what I argue is that the two keys to sustainability are energy and innovation. Um, so innovation, yes, is a fundamental part of sustainability and, 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 and dealing with complexity. And, and later in our discussion, I'll be happy to, to go into that. Okay. So in your book, you also stated that there are, are 11 major themes in the explanation of a collapse. And the first one is depletion or cessation of a vital resource. Well, if we could narrow that down a little bit more, would you say, and and I don't know how this necessarily equates to the monetary supply, but the monetary supply is part of an integrated society where in the current iteration, uh, money is created via debt. So could we look at that as de- as a depletion of a resource, the ability to grow more debt, which is definitely having diminished return over time? Would that make sense? Oh, oh yes, very, very definitely. And, and I'm glad you brought this up. Uh, of course, back in 2008, we had uh, the, the terrible financial meltdown and, and the long-term recession that followed it, a very deep recession. And and part of how we got our clawed our way out of that problem was that the government took on massive new levels of debt. Now there have to be limits to how much debt any government can take on. And and I thought at that time and still think today, how are we going to cope the next time a crisis of that magnitude comes along? Are we going to be able to take on that much debt again, or have we reached the point where we can't take on? that level of debt again. I, I don't know. I'm not a financial expert. I'm a social scientist. I don't know whether we've reached that point, but we will reach it someday. Right. And it, it does look, um, you know, where I see it as a financial expert a lot is in the monetary velocity or the speed that the money changes hands in society as an indication of stimulation. So talking uh, about innovation, pushing things off, 
we can see from the monetary velocity alone, and there are other areas, but we essentially hit peak debt in 97, where after that, no matter how much more debt we've grown, we've had diminishing returns in terms of uh, economic stimulation and the division, and I think, and you talk about this in your book too, although I, I always approach things from an economic standpoint, but uh, then you see the division between the uh, one percenters and the 99 percenters, the income inequality gap really starting to expand, you know, from that point. So, I don't know, in your experience, if you can just kind of translate that into what that looks like, like the fall of the Roman Empire, where they started degrading the currency to a point where it was no longer acceptable. Isn't that part of it as well? Well, yes, both, both you know, the, the Roman Empire it, it had currencies based in actual valuable metals, gold and silver, and then they used ordinary copper coins for everyday transactions. Uh, but value was based in gold and silver. And, and as the empire grew more complex and costly, they had to debase the silver content. Uh, it went from 98% silver in the first century AD down to about 2% silver uh, in the year 270 AD. Uh, and this is what they had to do to cope with the increase in complexity and costliness of simply being the Roman Empire. Um, and, and we see that process today in, in government borrowing. Both are strategies of essentially shifting costs onto the future. We, we cope with current crises that we may, may not be able to afford to deal with at the moment by shifting the cost onto the future. You know, debasement of the silver currency among the Romans and government borrowing as we practice it today, those are both equivalent strategies, and we know that in the case of the Roman Empire, uh, it seriously undermined their fiscal stability and contributed ultimately to their collapse. So yes, we, we see the same processes going on. Uh, in, in some ways, there are new things in history, and in other ways, if we look at history, we see the same things over and over. Uh, yeah, exactly. And if you, if you ignore the lessons from history, they always have a tendency to repeat itself. So if I look at the monetary system in that context, when we went off the uh, gold standard, that was a way to just kick the can and then uh, give debt that bigger role. But now we essentially, according to the Federal Reserve, have no, le we don't have any but four cents left of purchasing power value in the dollars. So now we have to go to principle, which is what negative rates are about, and I'm wondering if that's not an indication of where we are in this whole cycle. Well, money today essentially consists of confidence. Money, money works on the basis of confidence. Exactly. In, the past, in the past, money worked on the basis of, of, of actual valuable metal. Um, and, and even when I was young, I can remember that dollar bills were stamped silver certificate. You could take a dollar to the treasury and they would give you a dollar's worth of silver for it. Now money consists, well, money consists mostly in computers and, 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 and it works only as long as we have confidence in it. Um, and, and again, I, I think this is yet another concern for the future. How long will we continue to have confidence in currency? I think the the spread of these um, cryptocurrencies is an indication of people looking for alternatives. Exactly, because you because really we've seen society uh, morph, and it's pretty obvious to the normal person who's been chosen to win in this game and lose. It seems to me, at any rate, if you're paying attention at all, that it's pretty obvious that that they've pick their sides, and the masses are really not part of that. The cryptocurrencies yes. could be a way, perhaps, to keep this going, uh, but for the energy, at least in the private cryptocurrencies, that it takes to create them with all the algorithms. If, a, if there was like a Fed coin or, or another central bank coin, well, that could just be created and use a lot less energy, don't you think? Yes, definitely. Um, and, and, and again, I, I'm glad that you emphasized the energy cost of producing the cryptocurrencies because 
Uh, and energy ultimately is the basis of everything that we do. You know, we're, we're largely unaware of this today. You know, we're unaware that we pay for complexity through energy because to us, energy is almost invisible. Exactly. Uh, we don't have to go out and gather firewood like our ancestors did. Most of us don't have to go out and till a field like 90% of our ancestors had to do. Um, to, to us, energy is just something that you pull up to uh, a corner fuel station and, and pay a few dollars for, uh, and, and it just magically appears. So we're largely unaware of how important energy is to us today. Right, and, and especially in creating food. Because as you mentioned, most people don't go out and till the soil for their food anymore. They go to the grocery store and they buy their food. But what would happen if there was a disruption in that energy source? Oh, oh indeed. As the saying goes, no city in the world is more than three days away from a riot, which means there's no city in the world that has more than a three-day supply of food, approximately. Uh, and, and this is a problem that's been created in our economic system by the practice of just-in-time delivery. Yeah. Uh, it has created vulnerabilities in, in, in our well-being and the potential for terrible calamities if that system ever breaks down. Exactly, and that's, and that's a big if. But if we're more and more dependent on the, you know, on the networks, the computer networks for all of our functioning, for even delivering electricity to the homes, or for moving money around the world, I mean, do you see that as um, an issue? Do you think that there's a problem with the infrastructure on the grid and the ability to continue to deliver, you know, that energy, regardless of the cost almost. Well, c certainly our reliance on computers, as we're becoming increasingly aware, has created vulnerabilities. And right. um, a, 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 an enemy with computer capabilities, let's say Russia or North Korea, uh, you, you do have to worry whether they're in a position to disrupt our economic system simply by uh, disrupting uh, the, the computer system on which it works. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, and when that, in your experience and from your research, when a complex society collapses, what does that look like? Maybe well, the society simplifies. That's, that's the primary characteristic is that the society simplifies. Um, what we see in past societies, uh, we sometimes use the colloquial term dark ages, like the, the dark mm -hmm. ages in middle, in medieval Europe following the collapse of the Roman Empire. Uh, the, the, the hierarchy, you know, the, the, the superstructure built on top of the agricultural population, uh, it, it partly disappears. Um, levels of government entirely disappear. Sometimes literacy declines. Trade disappears. And, and we see in a lot of cases that leading up to the collapse, there's often a, a, either a leveling or an actual decline of population almost as an early indicator of problems. Hmm. Now, a collapse today would be simply catastrophic uh, because we would, you know, if, if the supply systems were disrupted, if food was no longer being delivered to the cities, we would have tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people dying within a period of two to three months, dying of lack of food, of disease, of, of violence. Uh, it, I mean, it, it's a catastrophe that, that's just too horrible to imagine. But yet they're living through it in Venezuela right now. They, they are indeed. Um, they're not losing population so much. I mean, they are managing to get at least minimal amounts of food to their people, uh, as long as the people are politically loyal. But certainly what you see in Venezuela, I was in Venezuela a little over two years ago and, 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 and did some interviews there and said at the time that I thought, yes, well, Venezuela is vulnerable to collapse. And, and to some degree, we're seeing at least part of that process today. Right, and yet they're sitting on the largest uh, hoard of oil in the world, or the reserves. Yes, yes. And well, in, in their case, there's a severe problem of, of mismanagement. Well, okay, I think we could make that argument globally, <laughs> that there's yes, been a pretty yes. severe case of, of mismanagement. But I also, uh, there's also a difference, um, and you talk about this, how there is an expansion of the uh, ruling party, right? So there's more greater specialization. 
And in, in a case like Venezuela or others, uh, the mil military steps in to take over a lot of those roles. Is that yes, consistent? Yes, well, Yes, well, we, I mean, we've we've seen that in in any number of of the third world countries over the years that 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 as as these societies begin to disintegrate, very often the military does step in. Right, and they take on a greater and greater role. So yes, what happens in these cases when there's greater specialization? Because it definitely feels like we're going through that right now, where since two thousand and eight. The middle class jobs have been basically annihilated. So you have the and and you see robotics taking over, artificial intelligence, big data. These are all parts that make society even more complex. How, how do you see big data and AI uh, in this integration, or as an indication of where we are? Well. The these are aspects of what I would call organization. They're, they are ways of taking our highly differentiated society and looking for commonalities that firms can use for marketing purposes um, and, and that politicians can also use for their own marketing purposes you know, with, in what's called micro-targeting. Um, you know, this, this has been going on in our last few election cycles where big data are used to develop profiles of small numbers of people who are thought to be prone to vote this way or that way and then targeting them with specific advertising. Uh, so it, it, it's simply part of how our society, our political system, and, and, our, and our, uh, our, our commercial system are evolving. Um, but, but as far as the larger role of, of big data are concerned, I, th I think there are I think there's some serious concerns about it. I've, I find myself concerned about it, about a loss of privacy. Uh, I've seen a news article recently about computer algorithms that can identify, say, a, 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 or classify people according to sexual orientation just from profiling their faces. Uh, this, is, this is scary stuff. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm finding this very bothersome. Oh, I, I would definitely agree with that. I mean, over time, they've put more and more of those sensors where they can detect your face and your voice. You know, it's on every corner. It's, it's integrated in everything we do with the computers. And, and it's part of that complexity, isn't it? Yes, it is. And, and, and while we have time, I think we should get back to the topic of innovation, if, if that's all right yes, with you. Yes, I think that's great. Um, because, as, as I said, I see the problem of sustainability coming down primarily to two elements, uh, energy and innovation. We, we've mm -hmm. covered energy. Um, as resources become scarce, there is a line of thinking among economists that resource scarcity is never really a problem. It's just a matter of things being priced wrong, that as long as we have the price mechanism and, and unfettered markets, we'll just always innovate will come up with new resources or will develop more effective ways, more efficient ways of using the existing ones so that, so that resource scarcity is, should never be a problem. And, and, and to a degree, one would have to say that the economists who adopt this line of reasoning have been largely correct up to this point. The problem that I see and I think has not been considered is that there's an implicit assumption projecting this into the future that the productivity of innovation remains constant that what we invest in innovation will always give us a constant level of return. But innovation is a system of increasing complexity. You know, in the 19th century, we had the age of lone wolf naturalists who could invent entire fields of learning just by working alone. People like Charles Darwin or Gregor Mendel or Marie Curie, uh, these giants who revolutionized, revolutionized entire fields of learning. Today, more and more, research is a complex joint enterprise involving interdisciplinary teams, uh, large institutions, large amounts of monetary investment. Mm -hmm. and, and one has to ask, what are we getting back for, uh, for all of this complexity and all of this investment? And I had this I had this question in mind for a number of years, and in fact, since the time that I was writing the Collapse Book in the 1980s, um, in about 2006 or seven or so, I, I, I well, it, what I'll say is that I didn't I, I wasn't sure how to answer the question because I didn't have a database 
Uh, about 2006 to 2007, I met a couple of economists who had the database to allow us to address it. Uh, these are my colleagues, Deborah Stromsky and Jose Lobo. They're both at Arizona State University. And they had a database of patents. So what we looked at is what are we getting in return for our investments in innovation in terms of patents? Okay. And we quantified the productivity of innovation as patents per author. What we found is that over a 30-year period starting about 2004 and going through 2005 is that it's taking more and more innovators to achieve a patentable breakthrough, a patent, something worth patenting. And conversely, the productivity of innovation, which we measure as patents per inventor, is actually declining. So we argue that in actuality, uh, the productivity of our system of innovation is declining in its productivity. And in fact, over that 30-year period, which would be about the length of an average scientist's career, uh, the productivity declined by over 20%. Now, if you take this and project it one or two generations out into the future, our system of innovation is simply going to become very expensive and much less productive than we know today. Hmm. And it's questionable whether innovation in the future will solve problems as it has up to this point. Wow. You know, that's actually really interesting, especially in light of the transition that we seem to be in right now with going into what, what is being called the fourth industrial revolution, which is yes. all around that big data and that AI. And there's been uh, thousands of new patents on this new technology by all of these uh, corporations, right? So has yes, that yes, yes, certainly. So has that shifted? Well, or? we we looked we looked at patenting overall. We had a database of over five million patents for that thirty year period, and, and we see a clearly decline a clear trend of declining productivity, de declining returns on investment yep. um, over over that period. Then we did, then we looked specifically at some individual fields. We looked at some older fields like. Uh, drugs, optics, and so forth. And, and, and in those older fields, you expect to see declining productivity, and, and in fact, we do. Then we looked at newer fields where you would expect to see productivity increasing. Right. Uh, we looked at information technology. We looked at biotech and nanotech. And, and instead, what we see there is also declining productivity almost right from the start. Uh, biotech and nanotech were classified as, as separate technologies in the patent system only in 1980, but right from the start, we see declining productivity of innovation in those fields. And surprisingly enough, we see it in information technology. Uh, you, you wouldn't guess this because there's constantly new electronic widgets for us to buy, but in fact, uh, if, if you measure productivity through the patent system, the productivity of the investment in those technologies is declining. And, and if you look at the products that emerge through that system, uh, you can see breakthroughs. Let's say the first uh, iPhone was right. clearly a major breakthrough. But, but what happens after that is that you get these small incremental improvements, you know, the iPhone 8, the iPhone 9, the iPhone 10, and so forth, which offered only small increments of, of functionality in exchange for $1,000 of your money. Um, and in exchange for a lot of money that Apple invests or, or any company invests in producing these products. So you, you can see that, in fact, um, even in new fields like information technology, the productivity of innovation is declining. So the, these are my two concerns for the future, uh, energy and innovation. And, and you, you know, it's so interesting because, you know, I like to look at things long term because you get a completely different picture than if all you look at is a little bit, you know, just a little section, which is what we've been taught to think in terms of very short-term thinking. That's where they want us to be. But even stepping back and looking at a study on, really, that's a study on innovation, and you can see that that is declining. So uh, you're ab you're absolutely right, and and I have argued that you have to look at political and and economic and social trends long term to understand them. Absolutely. And we do know that confidence in the system is at the lowest level that it's ever been historically in our political mm -hmm. system. 
Um, not as much in the financial system, but certainly declines. I mean, you know, we're in the melt up phase of a stock market that hasn't seen any month over month decline, I think in something like over a year. It's ridiculous. So to me, this is an indication, but do you have any thoughts on what they're calling that fourth revolution? which is on this technology in addition to what we just talked about? Well, one of the concerns about it, of course, is that information technology does not produce as many jobs as assembly lines did. Exactly. And, and, this, and this generates political discontent like we saw in the last presidential election, where, which was largely decided by unemployment in the upper Midwest and in Pennsylvania. And, and I think we can look into the future and foresee more and more political conflict coming out of the economic shifts that we're going through today. I think they're going to call out for universal income to counter that. But, you know, they could argue productivity, right? You're doing more with less people, but people still need to work. They need to feel like there's a purpose in them being here. They need to feel that there's a purpose and people need to be able to support their families. Exactly, exactly. Well, let's take some questions. We've got Liminal Lady asks, what does a society look like during and following a collapse? Well, what, what you see, what, what I have argued in looking at ancient societies is that as they grow more complex and costly, ultimately that investment reaches the point of diminishing returns. You see this clearly in the Roman Empire, which went through a, a severe crisis in the 3rd century AD and, and almost ended in the 3rd century. But they increased the size and complexity of the government and the army um, and managed to survive for another 200 years. But this was very costly. They had to increase taxes and continue to debase the currency. And what was happening was that they were increasing in costliness just to maintain the status quo. It just cost more and more to be the Roman Empire. And so and, 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 and this is axiomatically a case of diminishing returns. So you can see the empire beginning to fall apart. There, would, there were rebellions in, in provinces in Gaul. Um, provinces would break away, bands of bandits formed and, tried to, and, and would prey upon people and, and upon the government. Um, the, the, there, were, there were continual invasions, and the government, uh, the Roman army, was becoming less and less capable of containing invasions from Central Europe and from the East. So you, you can just see things starting to break down. And then when the collapse comes, it happens very quickly. And by very quickly, I mean, say, within a generation or two. Uh, in right. historical terms, that would be fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and after that, then the unity that had prevailed throughout the Roman Empire simply disappeared. Um, you know, Western Europe broke up into various smaller kingdoms. Um, and so suddenly we find ourselves in the Middle Ages, where the Roman Empire is remembered sort of as an ideal pastime, uh, but in fact, uh, Europe went through this, this evolution of small kingdoms continually competing with each other, continual wars, until after a process of over a thousand years, the nation states that we see today began to emerge. So th there's, there's a breakdown of order, there's a simplification, there's often a loss of literacy, um, and, and there's fiscal weakness, uh, the population becomes disaffected, and as I say, we may be seeing some of that process today, uh, and these are all aspects of the process of collapse. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so things get pretty local for a while then, if people are trying to get prepared for what is most likely to come. We don't know exactly the moment that it becomes visible, but the underlying information that you're looking at and the underlying information that I'm looking at clearly shows a deterioration. And with what's happening and the complexity of all of these networks, if something should happen to the grid or to the, you know, the system, even the satellites, I mean, that's not fully in place yet. And a lot of that technology hasn't really been tested yet. But uh, do you think we could go real local for a minute or two? 
Well, that's what happens in in a collapse is is that is that society is not only simplified, but they collapse to the lowest common denominator, to basically local levels of organization. Uh, back in the 1950s, 1960s, we had you know, various films about what the aftermath of a nuclear war would be like, and this is exactly what those films portrayed was 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 people having to survive almost as individual family units um, because any higher level of organization had simply disappeared. Um, I, 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 a collapse in our society, I don't know if it would be quite that bad, but it would certainly be catastrophic. And you know, what we know today as the United States may very might very well not survive a collapse. Right. And, and that's why when, you know, when I'm talking about things, I'm talking, part of what I'm talking about is community and creating, like in my neighborhood, creating that community feeling with my neighbors so that if we need to, we can come together and we can work together to survive what we're going to have to survive. And that kind of leads into Tim's question. Um, Tim Hanlon asked, what is the recovery timeline if the society collapses? Is there a standard for that or does it depend on the length of time it took or, or what, what did your findings show? Well, I've I've done some other research on that, that in in things I've written that you probably haven't seen, and and what we see is that the time to reestablish a, a, a similar level of complexity to what was lost is is normally several centuries. Wow. So, so yeah. So in, I mean, in the case of Western Europe after the end of the Roman Empire, I mean, you, you you're talking easily a thousand years before a similar level of complexity developed in those societies. Uh, and and th this is fairly common. Wow. So do you, do you think that that's a possibility? Um, in this case, it's hard to imagine that. You know that it would that if something happened, you know we would go down to a base and take centuries to it, get back. It it depends in it it depends in part on what technology we would still be able to sustain. Um, a computer grid requires an international level of organization to support it. And if that international level of organization goes away, then there is nothing to maintain an international computer system. Um, there's nothing to maintain an international financial system. Uh, e even at the national level, as, say, things like roads start to deteriorate, uh, is there going to be a national level of organization to repair, for example, the interstate highways or to repair state highways? Um, it, it, a lot depends on how severe a collapse would be. Yes, yes, I can definitely see that. And and what needs to, you know, we talk about here, we talk about a reset, um, and they're talking about a complete financial system reboot. But one of the questions that I keep asking, because I don't really know the answer to this, but maybe you could shed some light on it, is you know, the, the old system, which is based on, the monetary system, uh, is based on ever-expanding debt. So yes. we have to shift into a new system because we've maxed out our credit cards. I mean, we, we have. Maybe we can add a little bit more, but we're, I, I'd be willing to bet anything. We are definitely somewhere near an end. So, so can they just transition the old garbage from the old system? which is based on to debt into the new system, which they want to be based upon algorithms and, and contracts without any kind of disruption? Well, I, I, I don't know that those are mutually exclusive. Um, I, I don't know that algorithms and contracts would mean that debt goes away. Uh, every, as, as you know, I'm sure better than I do, everything today runs on debt. Um, and, and I think one of the problems in, in 2008 in, in the fiscal meltdown is, is that no one knew what any banks were worth, uh, which ones were solvent, and, and, and we came very close to the financial system freezing up. Now, if you consider the financial system and debt freezing up so the credit is no longer extended and combine that with just-in-time deliveries, you, you have the makings of a real catastrophe. Yeah, absolutely. And that is what will happen because those issues were not solved. They were just covered yeah. over with more debt. Right. So, so I don't know now, now uh, normally just to finish that question, uh, but 
you know, I know that normally when, when a, in a money standard shift, the length of time that they we're usually dealing with the reset lasts about half as long as the second phase into this. But this is a global issue, so I'm guessing it's going to be, I mean, I hope it doesn't take centuries. But, I, I mean, who knows what this is going to look like. This is huge. I mean, especially for where we are. So, well, what, what happened in 2008 was nothing like a real collapse. No. Uh, I, what I mean by a real collapse is something like the end of the Roman Empire, where life becomes local and everything simplifies. You know, right. nothing li we didn't get even close to that. No, we didn't. We, we could have, though, if they had we could turned have. on those yes. printing presses. We definitely, it, it was definitely freezing. So they just yes. opened up those spigots to postpone it. And that's what they're talking about doing now with all of the crypto stuff is opening, taking that innovation and keeping running with it. But uh, what has the role of money been throughout societies that collapse? That's a good question. Well, not, not all of the societies that collapsed in the past had currencies. For example, the Maya, um, they may have used things like cacao beans as a kind of currency, but they didn't have anything like the currency of the Roman Empire. Right. Um, th th there were collapses in ancient China, but again, they weren't based so much on, on finance. We don't really know much about what caused collapses in ancient China. The, the primary example we have involving a currency is the Roman Empire. Uh, and, and later in time, um, you know, the, in, in the Eastern Mediterranean, the, what had been the Eastern Roman Empire, we call it the Byzantine Empire, survived the collapse. Uh, but they had their own collapse um, beginning uh, in the 7th century when uh, the Arabs, who had been newly converted to Islam, seized half of, of their land. Uh, and the Byzantine Empire then had to, had to rapidly simplify, and, and, and they did and survived. Um, but in that case, what we see is that their monetary system almost disappeared altogether. It was it was an aspect of the simplification that th their monetary mm -hmm. system almost went away. There's a period of about 200 years from about 600 to 800 A.D. when coins are very rare in archaeological sites. They, they apparently no longer had much of a monetary economy. Uh, the monetary economy went away, uh, and gradually over time it was reestablished, but it took a couple of hundred years. Wow. This is really, I mean, I don't think we could be living in more interesting times than we are right now. You know, that's, in my opinion, <laughs> that's a, I don't know whether or not it's a gift, but I'm glad that I'm here to experience it. And, um, James, well, pardon, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no. No, I, I was going to say, I, I think future historians will find us fascinating. Oh, <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. Uh, James Richter asks, if we deplete an energy source, what energy source would you say that will most likely be, and how will that affect us, in your opinion? Well, unlike a lot of people, I'm actually a fan of nuclear. Um, although world uranium supplies are limited, um, you know, uranium is like any other resource, there's only so much of it. But the main concern is the energy return on investment, in, particularly in petroleum. Um, in the United States, our energy return on investment, as I said, is down to about 15 to 1, um, mm -hmm. and it will continue to go down as we, you know, we, we, we pluck the low-lying fruit, and that's what yeah. we did with petroleum. We, we first tapped um, the, the big deep pools in places like Texas and Louisiana and Oklahoma, and so then we have to go for supplies that are harder and harder to find and, and acquire, and so we go into, we go to the Arctic, we go into deep water in the Gulf of Mexico, and, and so forth. Um, when, when, when the energy return on investment, or EROI, gets down to about 8 to 1, that's when you hit a crisis point. Because then the energy cost of producing energy increases at a very, very rapid rate. Mm -hmm. I don't know when we will reach that point. As I said, there, there are still abundant supplies of petroleum in the world. But before we reach that point, we have to have made a transition to what I suspect will be a combination of primarily of renewables, um, perhaps with nuclear in some places that are less afraid of it. Um, other places that are afraid of nuclear simply aren't going to go that route right away. Right. But, but within a few decades, I would say within 40 to 50 years, we need to have made a transition to, to a mix of other energy sources, um, ideally ones that are clean and abundant. 
Right. Like uh, wind would be one, solar would be one. Um, I don't know if they're cost effective. Water would be so these are there are some options out there but I'm not sure how cost effective they are in comparison well they're they're becoming more cost effective the problem with most of the renewables is that they have what what we would call low energy density uh would you know compared to say petroleum so it takes very large land areas to produce the same energy per person as as we have now if we're reliant on things like wind and solar mm -hmm interesting okay bill asks are there basic signs of a collapse before it goes full-blown oh oh yes certainly um, as I said one of the early indicators we seem to see in ancient societies is that population either levels off or starts to decline um, anywhere from a few decades to even a couple of centuries before the collapse uh, the fiscal system becomes weaker. We see increasing disaffection. Uh, in, in the Roman Empire, we have records of people actually going over to the, to the German people who were, bar who, who were invading the empire um, because they wanted to escape Roman taxation. So there's this, this high level of discontent. Um, the empire was increasingly unable to, uh, to fulfill its obligations to pay the army and, and to keep the frontiers defended. So yes, you, you see early indications of the process, but you have to look at long-term trends to right. detect those indications. You always do. And you know what occurred to me is that uh, the generations that are coming, uh, coming behind, uh, like I'm a baby boomer, the generations are not living as long. Hasn't that shift occurred where uh, the lifespan expectation of, uh, of a person now is not as long as it was in this generation? Well, it, life expectancy is still increasing, but, it, but it's increasing at a slower rate than it did um, previously. The, the primary improvements in human longevity came from advances in sanitation rather than advances in medicine. Right. Um, you know, supplying cities with clean water and, and with, with ways of disposing of sewage, those were the major advances in the, that brought longer life expectancy. But you see in, in a case like the collapse of the Maya that that before the collapse, it, you know, just from studying the, the skeletal remains that we have of those people, it appears that people were in fact becoming shorter. Um, they, they were they, they were smaller. They were shorter. They appear to have been in poorer health. And these are again early indications of the collapse that was coming. But you have to again, as I said several times, you have to look at long-term trends nice. to be able to detect these patterns. Mm -hmm. So I, I definitely agree with you. I like to look at my long-term trends. That's where you really see what's happening, regardless of what happens short-term. John uh, Burkett asks, do you see a hyperinflation scenario in the U.S.? I, I can see circumstances under which one might occur if we if we had another major fiscal breakdown like we had in 2008 and the government had to begin had to begin printing money yes i, I could certainly see that happening mm -hmm. uh, f fortunately the united states government is more fiscally responsible than say the venezuela government uh, but even still I, I could i could foresee it happening and i would agree with that so this has been absolutely eye-opening and just a wonderful experience. Thank you so much, Dr. Tainter. Is there anything else that you would like to direct us to so that we can pay attention to this and, and become educated? You know, ignorance doesn't make you immune. It just leaves you vulnerable. So we're keen on education here for sure. What, what, I, would, what I would recommend um, is another book that I published in 2012 um, which it's, it's more of a mass market book. It was written in response to the Gulf oil spill. Um, so I teamed up with a petroleum engineer, Tad Patsek. Uh, he wrote several chapters on the technical aspects of, of the oil spill, and then I wrote several chapters on energy and complexity in our society. Uh, and, and that book synthesizes the, recent, the work that I've done since the collapse book came out. Um, it's titled Drilling Down, 
the Gulf Oil Debacle and Our Energy Dilemma, and it's published by Copernicus Books, which is, uh, I think, a, an imprint of Springer. Uh, you can you can find it online. You can find it at, at Amazon if, if anyone wants to go looking yeah, at, we'll, for it. We'll put the uh, link on there. We'll put the link okay. on there to make it easy for everybody. Uh, this is the book that I read. It was wonderful. I think everybody should read it to understand that this is a repetition of history. And, and if we don't learn from history, we have a tendency to repeat it. And... Uh, can we also, you know, kind of close with there are opportunities that come inside of a collapse if you're prepared for it. It's much easier to weather and take care of yourself, your family, and your community. So, yes, there, there. You know, when there are crises, there are always winners and losers. There are always people who figure out how to profit. Exactly. So that's part of what we're looking at here today. Thank you so much. And, you know, if you like this, give us a thumbs up, subscribe to us on YouTube, follow us on, uh, on Twitter, uh, subscribe to us. We did that. I'm sorry. I'm still, <laughs> still a little foggy. Uh, but next week I'll be on with Trad Cat Night Radio interview. We're recording on the 31st. I don't know what day it'll be published. And give us a call. 888-696-4653. If you have any questions about this interview or anything else, we're here to be of service. And you take care out there. Bye-bye. And thank you, Dr. Tainter. Bye-bye. My pleasure. Bye.